Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Neuroradiology trauma. So this one, I broke into two groups of 12. We're going to have 12 intracranial hemorrhage cases and then 12 of face and spine trauma. Okay, this is a pretty incredible case. This is a right internal carotid dissection leading to occlusion. And that seems bad enough, but look at this on the right. You can still see the distal right ICA is occluded here. But on the left, Right up at the skull base, sorry, the right ICA still out right there within the carotid canal and completely unopacified. But look here at the skull base on the left. There is a dissection flap there in the left internal carotid artery. And this is a common location for carotid injury is right at the skull base in trauma. Higher up, you can see the, there is opacification of the vessel, but it's not filling the entirety of the carotid canal as it definitely should be. So tune yourself to that. I'll tell you, ever since this case, uh, I have followed everything very closely around that bend at the skull base and make absolutely sure you see the entire canal filled. So let's look at the video here. You can see the dissection and the occlusion. Now the right ICA is gone. Let's watch that left one though. Now you start to see the flap and the incomplete filling of the vessel all the way up into the carotid canal. Let's look at that again. So on the right, you'll spot the dissection, which quickly progresses to occlusion. Now on the left, you'll see it here, right there, right there, and now up into the canal. Pretty impressive. A colleague of mine and I were reviewing this together, and I remember his insightful comment on the fact that Basically, this guy had lost one internal carotid and was just about to lose another, and he he had uh, quite the pithy comment, something to the effect of, uh, how screwed is this guy? Pretty impressive. Well, ultimately, the uh, the left carotid was not called. We called the right carotid dissection, but the left was not called. The interventionalist ultimately took him and found the left one when they fixed the right. They ultimately did just leave the left one alone, hoping that by fixing the right, uh, they would maintain his uh, intracranial circulation. So pretty impressive. A real lesson in search satisfaction, no doubt, right? You see that occluded right ICA and you figure you're done. Okay, this is an impressive injury involving multiple vessels. First of all, you can see there is early return in the jugular, right? So that is clear sign of a carotid jugular fistula somewhere higher in the neck. Obviously, we don't see it on the left side. Higher up, you can actually see that fistula. There's the communication. This is a large carotid pseudoaneurysm. This is the communication to the jugular. This is an additional pseudoaneurysm on the opposite side of the carotid. Uh, filling through a narrower neck and thus less opacified with contrast. So there's that additional pseudoaneurysm. In addition, look at this, the damage to the posterior elements. This is actually where the bullet came through and you can see the vertebral artery is absent on this right side. And ultimately there is the bullet uh, lodged in the subcutaneous tissues of the posterior neck. So appreciate on the right, we have early jugular return, have a communication between the carotid pseudoaneurysm and the jugular. We have another pseudoaneurysm on the backside of that one. 
This guy had a little thyroid lesion. There it is, the other pseudoaneurysm. And there is the disrupted lamina and the absent right vertebral artery. So again, this guy had a little uh, non-contributory right thyroid lesion there, but there is the right jugular return, the left carotid pseudoaneurysm, and the communication between the two. So let's look on the coronal. Again, early return of the jugular, carotid pseudoaneurysm, back a little more, the other pseudoaneurysm, and then Look at that, the right vertebral artery just uh, tapering out to nothing. And even farther back, the hole in the lamina made by the bullet, which ultimately lodged here. There's the carotid pseudoaneurysm, the other pseudoaneurysm, now the vertebral artery. the hole in the spine, and then ultimately the bullet in the subcutaneous tissues. Pretty complex case. The 3D actually, you know, it's so very rarely helpful, but it is kind of cool to see these uh, fistulas because you do get that early venous return and you see an extra vessel on the involved side. And there's actually that second pseudoaneurysm there behind the carotid tucked away. And there's the bullet posteriorly. These are mostly just cute, but again, you can see that two-vessel pattern where there should only be the one on that right side of the neck. There is that other pseudoaneurysm there on the back side of the carotid, and there again the bullet. So that is a carotid jugular fistula. This is a dural AVF, very unusual. This is the kind of thing uh, that really separates the men from the boys. A particularly talented neuroradiologist made this call, and every time I see it, I'm still impressed. There is anterior epidural density there in the spinal canal. There's no question. I think everybody would get that there is an epidural here, but there is that little focus of contrast opacification with sort of an arborization, a wispy linear density extending out from it that looks for all the world to be vascular. So here it is on the sagittal. You can see that anterior epidural. Again, that one, no one's going to miss. But here's that tiny focus of contrast density that represents a small dural AVF. And here it is. You can see that anterior density. And there is the contrast opacification, that wispy vascular appearance to it. See how it's really present throughout all the way up to the skull base. But right there, that one little dot, that's an AVF. All right, and let's look at it on the sagittal. Impressive and extensive on the sagittal. That one little dot is no more obvious. You see that vascular characteristic that leading away from that one dot. Here it is again, and you'll be able to see a little vessel trail away. There it went. All right, a traumatic dural AVF. This is an atlanto-occipital dislocation. This obviously a very severe injury. You don't see it imaged all that often because nobody survives it. Uh, but here you can see both anteriorly and more pronounced posteriorly, there is spinal canal density consistent with an epidural hemorrhage. On the bone windows, though, there is the clear atlanto-occipital malalignment. The occipital condyles shifted up and forward from the atlas. Same on both sides. So we'll look first, that extraaxial hemorrhage. 
and then at the condylar dislocation. Pretty important to look at this on the coronals or the sagittals. You're never going to make this call on an axial image set. You know, it's funny. When you lectured 20 years ago, you had to tell people, you know, make sure you're looking at all these planes. I'm sure you guys have uh, such universal access to all these planes that it's, uh, it's probably not the kind of thing I need to tell any of you. All right. One more, one of my favorites. This is quite a case. So this one starts at the very first image. That is a cricothyrotomy incision. And it's below the level of the cords. It's below the level, for that matter, of the laryngeal cartilage. And it is always a sign of a difficult intubation. Right? When people go for a, for a cric, uh, things are dire. Right? Our next cut here is in the upper thorax. And you can see there is a transverse spine lucency. This was in the days when uh, I couldn't do sagittals or coronals, so that's the only view you're going to get of it. But as we look at the spine, I want you to appreciate the fact that this patient's spine is completely fused. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, everything. It is completely fused. And this is the only lucency you'll see transversely. There are no disc spaces in this patient's spine. In addition, you will note that there is complete fusion of the transverse, the costotransverse joints, which is uh, also a synovial joint and which can be seen in ankylosing spondylitis. And lastly, we've got horrific soft tissue gas, terrible placement of multiple chest tubes, uh, really kind of a management disaster. This patient, uh, again, there is the costotransverse joint fusion. Now look at this. There's gas in the epidural, in the spinal canal itself, right, that has gotten there through the fracture that we were looking at earlier. And here again is that left chest tube. This one goes right through the lung parenchyma. So uh, it may not be worse than the one that's outside the chest cavity completely, but it's not a lot better. Lastly, let's look at the sacroiliac joints, which are completely fused. Dr. Martell from the University of Michigan told me many, many years ago, if the sacroiliac joints are not fused, then whatever else you're looking at is not ankylosing spondylitis. Very, very helpful. I refer to that comment all the time and make use of it all the time. So here's what happened in this case. Uh, oh, a couple more things, just to see on lung window, the epidural gas. Okay, so this patient came in with a head trauma. They decided to intubate him. Because of his ankylosing spondylitis, they fractured his cervical thoracic spine, necessitating the placement of a cricothyrotomy because they could not continue with his intubation. Okay, we're noting all the spine fusion, the sacroiliac fusion, the costotransverse joint fusion, and there is the cricothyrotomy. Okay, there's that chest. There is the fracture that they gave him. And that fracture then opened up the spinal canal, allowing gas to get in from the gas that's in the soft tissues from the errant placement of the chest tube on the right. That is an extremely complex case. But if you're thinking, oh, come on, intubation resulting in fracture of an ankylosing spondylitis neck necessitating the placement of a cricothyrotomy, I've got three, actually four, cases of this in my files. So it's a, unfortunately, it is a common enough occurrence. Okay, that brings us to the end of neuroradiology, emergencies, and trauma.